Hey friend, did you know that Satanism, occultism, and spiritualism are wrong, wrong, wrong? Well, let me tell you, we're going to get into a study here, and I'm going to tell you why I think that these three um, faith groups are wrong according to the scriptures. Now, before I get into this, I want to remind you, please, if you like this video, like, subscribe, and share, and let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Now, one thing from which Christianity and spiritualism differ on is the sinful nature, human sinfulness. Um, uh, many spiritualists believe that people are naturally good, that humanity is progressive, and we're progressing onward, and we're naturally good, and just developing. But the Bible actually tells us something contrary. So as a Christian, I cannot side with spiritualism or occultism or any of that stuff. Well, 1 John 1.8 says that if we, if we say we have no sin, it's self-deception. So if we say we have no sin, we're self-deceived. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, we read about Satan's lie was that, well, you can be good without God, that you can be good and in transgression of God's law and be like God. This was, uh, was Satan's lie, and this is the spiritualistic lie, is that man is good in transgression, when in fact man is not good in transgression. It's Satan's lie. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 verses 6 to 7, talk about the fall where Adam and Eve had sinned and they had fallen away from God. So the reality is we all have a sinful human nature. We're not progressing. We are regressing. If we are outside of God and we, are, we have never yielded our hearts or our lives to him, we are regressing. But if our, we are connected to God and if we are serving the Lord and, and seeking him in his word through prayer and Bible study and, and uh, living out in a good faith to God, we will be growing up We'll be, we'll be progressing if we are in Christ and developing. But spiritualism te teaches that humans are naturally good and that we're progressing. But that's that cannot happen. Human nature is sinful and without God, we all regress. Now, Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's Romans also 3 verse 23. Romans 5 12, all have sinned. Romans 3 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Psalm 51 verse 5 says that from birth, we have a sinful human nature. So we all have this bent towards sin. None of us are naturally good. If left to ourselves and if God was not in the picture, oh man, this earth would be a super, super big, big, big mess. But because God's grace is working and His Holy Spirit restraining is restraining evil, there is mercy here today. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, we read about the desires of the human nature are corrupted. So we have this bent towards sin. We are corrupt by nature but the lord has given his son and by accepting him and through his holy spirit we can become holy and righteous as god is in his sphere as as we are in our sphere can we be holy and righteous god is is righteous in his so we can be like god in character now the deity of christ isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says a child will be born a son will be given uh, the logos the word will be given the counselor the mighty father the everlasting father the mighty god in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 pointing to the fact that the son that would be born would be Jesus Christ who is linked with the Father the counselor the Holy Spirit so in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 we have a clear depiction that Jesus Christ is in fact God in that prophecy and passages like John chapter 1 uh, verses 1 and 14 again you have the word logos the word made flesh Jesus Christ linked together with divinity there we have Jesus as God the deity of Christ is sure in the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and we must surrender our lives to Him. There are other kindred texts like Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, John chapter 20, verse 28, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. In particular, we read in Hebrews chapter 1 that God, through Jesus Christ, created everything we see and know, and God had declared it very good, in fact. So the creative work was through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is God. Actually, in Genesis chapter 1, we read about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all in the work of creation, Trinity. So, yes, Jesus is God, and he is part of what we call the Trinity, or Godhead. Now, in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, in Romans chapter 1, and verse 20, and in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, we have the Godhead mentioned three times. In uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 22, there was Trinity at Jesus Christ's baptism. You had Jesus the Son, and when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and God the Father said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have Trinity there. In Matthew 28, verse 19, um, Jesus, is, uh, bapti Jesus says to baptize people in the name of the Trinity in the Father, Son, and Spirit. And um, there's three persons named in some of uh, Peter's and uh, Paul's uh, letters, like in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, and 
2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. It's pretty clear Trinity is a reality. Godhead is, in fact, a reality. Uh, there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus is, in fact, God. Now, another thing where spiritualists and uh, Christians differ is on the nature of the Holy Spirit, whether it's a person or a force. Now, according to the Bible, we believe, as Christians, that the Holy Spirit is a person, part of the Godhead. In uh, John chapter 14, verses 26, and John chapter 16, verses 7 to 8, we read that the Holy Spirit is given, the, you know, for example, the capital C, Comforter. That is usually capitalized the name of places or people or, thing, or, or, or names of people. And so the Comforter is another name for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person, not a force. Another um, very good uh, Bible-proof text is Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. There was, uh, in, that, in that verse, it talks about how, in a, uh, how essentially there was a lying to the Holy Spirit happening. And um, basically, the, the couple are rebuked for lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's Acts chapter 5 verse 3, and the question is, well, can anyone lie to a force? Well, no, you have to lie to a person. You can only lie to people or God. And so the Holy Spirit clearly is a person and clearly is God. Now, the next part where Christians and spiritualists differ is on the natural immortality of the soul. Now, spiritists believe that we are naturally good and also naturally immortal, that the soul lives on and on, and that there's reincarnation. Well, the Bible tells me in Job chapter 4, verse 17, that man is only mortal. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, we are uh, told that people die once and then there's judgment. Now, we don't live and die multiple times. We got one life to live, so we better live it in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Now, uh, when you look at Psalms 146, verses 3 to 4, we're advised don't put your trust in human beings. And, when, and basically, when people die, their thoughts perish. In other words, Spirits can't intercede. People who die rest in their graves until the resurrection. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 5 to 6 state that the dead don't get involved with the living, plain and simple. So you can't talk to your dead relatives and your ancestors because they're asleep in their graves waiting for the resurrection. In John chapter 11, verses 11 to 14, we read that death is like a sleep. Jesus described death like a sleep. And when you're asleep, there's no conscious involvement. And so if you're dead in your grave, you have no involvement in the living, the affairs of the living. And uh, another uh, idea may arise and say, well, Ben, uh, you know, I heard this person and that person and the spiritualists and occultists and Satanists speaking with their deceased loved ones. How can this possibly be when you say the dead know not anything and rest in their graves? Well, in 1 Samuel, we read about King Saul. And King Saul, he had apostatized, he turned away from the Lord. And when he did so, he went and consulted the witch of Endor. And there she calls up a spirit. And that spirit rises up and, and, it's, uh, and it has the appearance of the prophet Samuel. Samuel had died. He's resting in his grave. So the question is, who was Saul talking to? And who was that witch conjuring up? Was it Samuel? Well, the Bible tells me that angels can take different forms and demons can take different forms. And the name of their game is deception. So, of course, a demon would take the opportunity to pretend to be the prophet Samuel and say, hey, yeah, Saul, your kingdom is in trouble and you're going to lose big time and discourage the man. And so that's the point. It was not an actual deceased Samuel who rose up from the grave to talk to Saul. No, God was done with Saul. Saul had apostatized. His heart was hard. And even and he was having feigned repentance. It was feigned. And so God knew it. And so he had left him to his own course. And so the devil stepped in. And when the devil stepped in, a demon took the place there to deceive Saul further. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, we read that God is immortal. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 to 16, we read that God only has immortality. So what does it mean then when we are promised immortality, eternal life? We're promised it. We are going to be given immortality at Jesus Christ's second coming. If we are dead in Christ, the dead in Christ rise first and they put on immortality. They're given immortality by Christ. And the righteous living which are with uh, when we are around when Jesus comes, well their bodies change and they are given immortality too. So the living change and the dead raise incorruptible with everlasting life. So it's conditional. It's given at the end and when Jesus comes the second time. So what we believe in in John chapter 10 verses 27 to 28, 
28 is that God gives immortality on the condition that we obey Jesus Christ. It's called conditional immortality. Yes, we're promised immortality. We're, yes, we're promised eternal life, but it's based on the condition that we receive Jesus Christ and don't apostatize and keep his law and his commandments. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54, uh, we read that everlasting life and, well, of course, immortality will be given to the righteous at Jesus Christ's second coming, as I've already reiterated, but I've given you the text. So it's pretty clear. I've proven to you now that spiritualism is deadly wrong. And if you're a spiritist watching this or an occultist or a Satanist that has picked up this video, I hope when I pray today that you will change your way, that Jesus, that you'll accept Jesus, the Lord and Savior, into your heart and experience that love that surpasses all understanding. Now, God bless you and keep you until we study again. God bless.